So, Dale, how are you? Good. That's really good. good. <laughs> <laughs> and so we're going to start in the beginning. So where were you born? I was born in Prescott, Arizona, April 21st, 1973. And um, where did you actually live? Did you live in Prescott? No, I lived in Mayer. In Mayer? It's just Prescott's the only hospital around. Oh, okay. That's it. And how was it growing up in Mayer? I thought it was great. What did you do as a kid? Rock fights and played in the creek a lot. We lived right next to the creek. That's what played in the creek all year long. Well, as long as the water ran, it ran seven months out of the year probably then. It doesn't run at all now, but it ran probably seven months out of the year then. And we played every day in the creek. <laughs> and what school did you attend? Uh, Mayor. Mayor, and was it, is it Mayor uh, Elementary? Yeah, it's Mayor Elementary, then Mayor Junior, and then Mayor High School. And uh, what other things did you do besides going to school with your family? Do you have any family memories when you Oh, yeah, out? we went camping. We, we did camped a lot when I was little. Went camping and fishing and stuff like that. And where did you typically go camping? White Horse Lake. Okay, where's that located? Okay, yeah, Up by Williams. Okay, that's neat. And um, how, I guess, did you grow up at all in the, Mayor is very close to Dewey Humboldt. Right? Yes, eight miles, seven miles. And did you ever have any interactions with the kids there in Dewey Humboldt or anything? Yeah, well, that's what, now, nowadays, it's Dewey Humboldt's the same, same city. It is one city, but when we were growing up, Dewey and Humboldt were different. They were always different. And... There was, it seemed like the kids from Humboldt were different. I mean, they were just different. They were a little bit off, if you want to say. They, I mean, nothing bad about them, but they were just a little bit off. And now maybe you kind of know why, because most of them are gone now. But they were all second, third, fourth generation living right next to the stacks and stuff. And that's probably why they were a little, a little off, looking at it now. You know, but there was always a difference between Humboldt and Dewey, and now they're just one. But there was when we were growing up, it was always different. And did your school like play sports against? Oh yeah, players? yeah, we played played sports uh, rivalries, but uh, Bradshaw, which was Dewey, was actually um, they were a different. They're different. Like we were Class C, they were a Class A school, so we didn't play them. Only in basketball and stuff like that, but football we didn't. Because it was a larger school? Or? Larger school, a lot larger school. They played 11-man, we played 8-man football. And so were you in the football team? I was on the football team for two years. And how was that? I wasn't, really, I wasn't too much into sports. <laughs> and so um, did you, what did you do for work? Did you have to work as a kid? Like sometimes you Well, I worked at the, it, actually I worked at the Hunt Club, Arizona Hunt Club. And that was a, was a, like a pheasant. You take guided hunts and stuff. Sporting clays were the clay pigeons, and I worked there from my freshman year all the way through the end of, till my senior year. And I actually got a used it and had won a trip to Europe through the FFA on it. Wow! And how was that? It was awesome. It Where was, did you go? Went to Belgium, Luxembourg, Germany, and Holland. And did you, uh, how long was your trip? Uh, like three weeks. Three weeks we were over there. And it was cool because it was structured during the day. And then it from, we had to be on the bus at 7 o'clock in the morning. We had to be there at 7 o'clock to get on the bus. And we went till it was structured till 3. But after 3, we were on our own. We could do anything we wanted to. And that's what we were actually encouraged to, you know, go see the nightlife, see what. He said they basically told us that um, we are treated as adults and we had a three-day orientation before we left on how to conduct yourself in the different countries and stuff and he gave us this little card he said memorize this card and it was an address and at the end of the orientation he said uh <clears throat> now who, who knows their address that knows that address and none of us did of course and he said well that's very important he said because most most things in europe are of what the european people want you to see of their country he said, and that's the way it, where it's going to be structured during the day, but at night, you're on your own. He said, when I say you're on your own, he said, that address is the American uh, embassy. And he said, if you get in trouble, he said, you're on your own. He said, you can call mom and dad and have them come get you. 
he said, and that's, that's how, you know, he said, I've left people before and I'll leave them again. And we're, it, it was pretty intense. I mean, it's crazy, but it was, we knew that we had a, um, all the, can't think of the name of it. The, our index basically said where we were going to be and, uh, each day. And so we, we knew that we had to be at the bus at seven o'clock in the morning. And if we weren't, then we'd better be there. We had, we knew where it was going to be the next day and try to catch back up with it and catch back up with the trip. And that was pretty, pretty wild. Yeah. That's neat that you had that experience, especially as such a young person, right? Yeah. I was 18 when I went over there. Mm -hmm. And after you graduated from then it was Mayer High School, what did you do? I went to Yavapai College for a year and then I went to Central Arizona College for two years after that. And at Central I was had I was a four point I was three point nine nine on a dean's list. And yet Yavapai was just it was like yeah, we called it Yavapai High because it was just basically it extended everybody that went there was from mayor, you know, there were a lot of people that were went to school with there, so you didn't really a lot more messing around than anything else. But in Central, I, had, I enjoyed Central. And what did you study there? Uh, civil engineering. Oh, wow. And how was it to study that there? It was cool. I liked studying it and stuff until I found out I could, you know, there wasn't that much call for it when in the real world and there was, a, you could, I was going in to, for surveying, basically. And then that's right when all the you know, satellite GPS and everything started taking over. And it was actually the technology was progressing faster than the school was. So everything, you, when I'd go to work during the summer, I'd come back and then I'd show that, you know, everything that was obsolete, you know, that we we're getting taught was totally obsolete. It had nothing to do with what it, what it was actually, how it was in the field now. So that was kind of, it was weird. It was right there in the, you know, a lot of technology had been in our early 90s. So it was, when everything was just starting to really take over and then I would it took over yeah that's what I'm trying to think technology too yeah there was a technology basically was going faster than the schooling was that's basically why I kind of stopped because there was there wasn't any point in it yeah and so in the summer did you work at yeah I worked for I worked for F and F construction during the summer and any break because I had a, a boss that was he would hire me for any any time. He said, anytime you got days off, just call me. And he said, I'll put you to work somewhere. And I'd call him and he'd tell me, okay, you got to be in Nevada tomorrow morning or something. And I'd go. And I'd, I worked in Nevada, California, Arizona, and well, just Nevada. I didn't never went, had to go to New Mexico because he always tried to put me on a job where it'd be decent money. That's really neat. And um, so that's very interesting background about you. Is there mm -hmm. anything else that you want to add of what you did or like, and even currently what you do? Currently what I do, I, well, that's where, how I got into mining. Because mining, my grand, if it's been, we were, my grandfather and stuff started a lot of quarries doing uh, building stone. And when I, that's what I was in California, when I went to work after I got out of, college I ended up going to California on the Seven Oaks Dam project and was there for four years working on crushers and um, we had 14 miles of conveyor belt that we were doing and that's what by trade that's what I you know I was a journeyman mechanic welder for crushers on crushers and it was in local tw local 12 the union union local 12 out of Southern California and then I came back came back to Arizona and went started around quarries and mining operations and that's where I've been doing that ever since and I've, I've I've kind of dropped scaled that way back to now I've gotten more into I do I carve change chainsaw bears and stuff like that with the chainsaw and so I do a lot of carving so wow and, and so that's a really tough job right it's real tough yeah I about cut my hand off last year I got cut with the chainsaw oh wow it was put me down for a little while but so it happens when you, you know, you, you can't foresee accidents. You just try to be as safe as you can and stuff happens. And then uh, can you tell me how did your family, when and how did your family arrive in Arizona? In Arizona, the 
had two different, they arrived in Yaffa County in between 1875 and 1878 from both sides. That's but at that time in 1875, that was right after the Civil War. And there was, it's just kind of hard to imagine that this area was, they were still fighting Indians. You know, they were, this was a un, no man's land in that, that time. Um, my one family, part of the family was, they came up from out of Sinaloa, Mexico with the, the, on the Dionza expedition and settled San Francisco. And the great, the granddaughter of one of the soldiers that was with the Mexican, or with the Spanish expedition, she married, a, a Bennett married, that's how it's say married to Bennett, and they moved to, from Half Moon Bay, California, to Prescott because of, she was having breathing problems. She couldn't, the humidity was, that's why they moved here was the humidity. And then she ended up, I think she had 10 kids, 10 kids in um, Groom Creek. And when they decided to build the dam for Goldwater Lake, they had to move because the homestead was covered up by the water of Goldwater Lake. And as they sold all their cattle and they bought another place, which is in Groom, which is in Groom Creek, and I think one of my cousins still actually lives at the actual old homestead. And my grandpa, or great grandpa Grant, they moved to Mare. And that's the, that was on the one side, um, my grandfather's side. On my grandmother's side, they all came into Cherry Creek with the Mc, McWhorter. McWhorter out of, and that's what they settled in Cherry Creek. But they were part of those where they were originally out of the Payson area, where they. They had the meadow, I think it was Meadow Valley Wars. I'm pretty sure it was Meadow Valley Wars up there with the sheep sheep, sheep guys and the cattle guys, and they were fighting each other. I'm not exactly sure which part we were. I'm, you know, I've, I've never really researched. I've, I've wanted to, and I just haven't. I knew I heard about it. I just didn't realize that we were part of it until not too long ago, and that's why I, I need to research it a little bit more, but that's what kind of interesting to me, and that's what on the, Bennett's side on my grandfather's side, there was 10 kids on one side. And then on my grand grandmother's side, there was 12 kids, one tier up, you know, so that you get on. when I checked on Ancestry.com, two tiers up, I was there already like 285. It just flatlined it was straight across where the tree, it was just flat across the bottom. It was just, you know, 10 and 12. And then with off of different sides, it was crazy. It was, you know, every there was every not every one of them married and had kids too. So I mean, there were it, two tiers up. I was at two hundred and eighty-five people. I was like, whoa. So that's that's kind of how we got. And that was they got here in eighteen seventy-eight and eighteen seventy-five respectively. And that's what I'm on one side. I'm I think sixth generation. On the other side, I'm seventh generation, depending on which side you look at. And so my daughter would be eighth generation, I guess. Yavapai County, seventh and eighth grade, eighth generation. Yeah, Pike County. And how does that feel to have that pioneering blood in you? I guess. Yeah, I don't know. It just feels. It just. I. Then I don't know. It just feels. I feel with the air. I didn't really. Wasn't that much into it until you know until a couple of years ago when people were all you've been there how long and like well we've been here since before it was a state you know and because. It was just, it's just something that's, I guess, your heritage. It's just, I don't know any different, so I don't know. I don't know how it feels. Just. And um, can it, then, who, what is the name of your mother and your father? My mother is, uh, she was Patty Whitting, Patricia Whitting, and my dad was Bruce Bennett. And then um, I, you also taught when I met you, uh, I think it was a couple weeks ago, we also were looking at your, it was your grandfather's um, uh, chest. Oh, yeah, that was my grandfather's chest. It had all the stuff in it that was, oh. and it was stuff from all over. You know, that's it. I have a lot of, um, he bought rent houses. He had a lot of rent houses and stuff. Well, a lot of the houses he bought, they were left, as is, you know, you bought it, it still had the stuff in it when you got there. And a lot of the old paperwork and whatnot, he would keep. And I still have, I still have a lot of it now. Lots of trunks, lots of, lots of documents and stuff that don't really mean it. They're not that, don't mean anything, but they have a lot, you know, payroll tickets and stuff from 1921 and 
water bills from 1903 and mayor and just it's just cr kind of crazy stuff you know that you don't really think that much about until you look and it's been over 100 years you know it's, and it still looks like it was sent in the mail yesterday and a lot of the newspapers and i've figured out why they kept some of them but there's a reason why they kept some of them especially when there's multiple copies of it and i haven't I've read through them. I haven't figured out why, but there was obviously something in there that was important to somebody, and that's what I haven't. Some of the stuff I kind of put together, and some of it I haven't. And what was your grandfather's name and your grandmother's name? My grandfather was Ralph Bennett, and my grandmother's name was Mona Bennett. Or it might have been Mona Maters. And then, yeah. Then his dad, my grandfather's dad, he was Grant and Cecilia Haley was her, his wife and that's what she, her name she was grant everybody called her granny bennett she lived in mayor and she's in charlotte hall she got a lot of stuff at charlotte hall and then her mother-in-law which would have been my great 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 grandma was one of that was the Al, alvina that she was at rodriguez that came from half moon bay california with this span with from the dion's expedition that was her grand grandfather was in the Dion's expedition, a Spanish soldier, and he was a Vasquez. <laughs> so that's really neat that you have the, all that information, right? Um, and then can you talk to me a little bit about your grandfather, Ralph Bennett, and what he did in the area? He did. Well, he had rent house, but he worked at the mine, the Iron King mine. They worked at, worked at the mine, and he actually hurt his back. He hurt his back in the mine, had to have it operated on. And it was one of the first operations where they took and took the, um, your vertebrae where they seize them together or hook them together. I don't know what that, exactly what it's called, but they hooked them, made them where it was just one. There's like four vertebrae, and now they're just like one where they're all pinned together or something. That's what they did to him. And then he had quarries and in little mines and stuff all over the place. And that's what I did a lot with him when I was a little kid. We'd ride around. I'd rode, I spent a lot, a lot of time with him when I was a little kid. And do you have memories of him when he worked at Iron King, or what? Uh, I would have been. I wasn't even been born yet. Okay, yeah. And he was he an underground miner? Yes, yeah. he was underground. And how long did he work there? I'd say probably a long time for ten more. Than probably between 10 and 20 years or 10, 15 years or something. I'm not exactly sure, but he was there a long time. So it was everybody else, you know, around this. That was a major employer in the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. And the, they would work there. And that's what, you know, actually kicked off the growth, the starting of the growth in this area. Because before that, it was just dirt. Everybody was dirt, dirt poor. And that was actually, you know, prosper. It was quite prosperous for a lot of the people in the area. And that's what brought in a lot of the families, although the ones in Humboldt that lived right next to the mines, I think it might have been kind of detrimental looking back now because you, you can kind of see why, you know, it was nobody knew, but now you can see it. You can see it, what happened. And um, it, it was interesting because I was talking to uh, one of the one of the miners that I've, I'm interviewing as part of this, and they remember your grand your grandfather. Oh, really? Yeah, and they said that he was a really good worker, a really good mine worker. Yeah, he was kind of, he worked in underground. That's why I never he never wanted me going underground. He wouldn't let us go in mines and stuff. That was one of the things he was he wouldn't let us go in them, stay away from them. You know, he was. He was adamant about that. He didn't want us anywhere near him. And he didn't want us anywhere near the tailings piles and up there, too. Yeah, when Ironite took over the mine, that's what he'd always tell us. He said, don't ever get a job there. Whatever you do, don't get, don't work there and stuff. And he said, although there's going to be, he said, they're messing up. They're making a big mistake digging in them tailings. He said, because they're going to have some problems. He said, there's going to be. I remember him, he would tell us all the time when we'd drive by and make sure we don't work there. And he'd always try to see where they were digging. And come to find out that they were, he knew that there was a lot of stuff buried in the tailings piles, you know, and there was lots of bad stuff up in there. So that's what he always told us never work there. Stay away from it, don't play. And he wouldn't let us, he wouldn't even take us in, in tunnels or shafts or anything like that, even though he knew a lot about it. He wouldn't let us go around them and wouldn't take us in them. So. 
So, and then do you have any other uh, memories of him uh, telling you stories that were tied to the tailings or even the smelter? Smelter, um, I remember when we take, when I was a little kid, we'd take aluminum to the smelter. And I can remember they had great big ingots, or uh, I guess they call it ingots, great big ingots of aluminum where they'd take and smelt the cans and stuff like that. And they'd have great big things of aluminum that were red hot on the ground. They just kicked them out on the ground. It was, I can, but I remember the feeling the heat off of it. You know, it was just, you could feel the heat way before you got to it. And then you could feel the heat coming off of it. And I can remember that really vividly but I don't know what they were doing at the smelter at the time I knew they were melting aluminum but other than that I don't know what kind of operation they were going on then then I think it was that would have been in the 70s so and did you ever play as kids in the like the area the smelter area or the I don't know La Fria, near there uh, uh not around not as we were kids I remember when I was in the 90s when uh, we got got on some quads and we were riding around on the in the ash piles out behind the smell uh, behind the smokestack, and we thought because we came up out of the river, I didn't realize we were that close to it. I didn't know where we were at, and we were spinning around. We were like, man, it looks like we're on the moon, and we were all cause we were totally covered in gray ash because we were all wet from being in the creek, and then got up there and kicked a bunch of that ash up, spinning around on quads and. We were totally gray, and it was it was kind of wild. But then we looked around, and I was like, trying to figure out where we were at, and then we were right next to that smokestack. We're like, oh, we're in, we're in Humboldt. And then because we we came up out of the river, went into the river by mare, and came up out of the river, and we were in Humboldt. It was just kind of I didn't realize it was that close. It was actually closer coming up the river than it is going down the highway, which is kind of crazy. So now I'm gonna ask you some questions about. Um, your grandmother Mona Bennett. I don't know if you can talk to me about what, like, what she did, who she was, and then some of the memories and stories that you want to share about. Oh, she was. She worked. Uh, she worked at the bank for when I was for as long as I can remember. She always worked at the bank. She was the manager of the bank for thirty years, I believe. Or well, she was a manager when she retired, but she'd worked for Valley Bank for thirty years, thirty or thirty-five. I think it might have been thirty. And then after she, then she retired and then she was, when I just a while back, cause she just passed this last couple of months ago, but a while back she was going, she'd been retired as long as she'd been working. As long as she'd worked, she'd been, re, she'd been retired 30, 30 some years now. And, and that was, she's, uh, that was kind of wild. She would sit, she was, she thought that was kind of neat that she'd actually been retired longer than she'd worked. So that was kind of cool. But she was, uh, and she started out, she was part of the, when they started the uh, Mayor Civic, see so they had their civic group in Mayor, and they had it when she said, they had, it was old ladies, and they didn't like the young ladies with kids, so they started, they, they ventured, they split apart and had two different um, groups, and they started, they had the, the one, I think it was called Civil, Civic Activity Center or something like that, and that was the younger ones. Well, they started their own group, and then they that's they raised money for to build the Mayor Rec Center that's there now, and they started the Mayor Dazes and stuff like that, and that's what, um, they were. She was in on. They started that, and then she worked for Charlotte Hall for a long time. She worked at Charlotte Hall, volunteered as a library, and was in on the Centennial Committee. She did a lot of work for the Centennial Committee. And she did lots of volunteer work on the, after she retired. And basically that's what she was. She was always a big advocate on education, women, especially women's education and, and stuff. And she was always big on the kids, you know, whatever you don't, don't have kids until you get to school and stuff. Well, then she turned around and she didn't have any grandkids until her one granddaughter was over 30. You know, all of us were in our thirties or before anybody had any kids. So it was kind of, she, her grand, great grandkids didn't come till late, late in life, you know, because there was a, about a 15 year space in there where nobody had, there were no kids in the family because they preached everybody went and getting their education and going their own way. And my, both, both my cousins, my own, well, my cousin and my sister, they both have their master's degree. And me and my cousin, we both had, I think we went three years. You know, we went on. But, we, you know, we all went to college and stuff like that. And she was 
big on that, making sure everybody went to college, and she took everybody on a trip to Europe. I didn't, she didn't take me because I won my trip to Europe, So, but she took all my sister and my both cousins to Europe after they graduated. And she just wanted to see the world. She liked traveling. She liked traveling a lot. And she went, I think she'd been on every continent except Antarctica. She'd been all, she went to great, walked in the Great Wall of China and went to the pyramids and she went all over. My grandpa didn't like going, so she always went by herself or with one of her friends. And that's what she, she when she wasn't traveling, she was just hanging out doing stuff around the mare. Wow, well, she sounds like a very independent woman, especially for her time. Maybe. Yeah, she was very independent. That's what she was very stout, you know, um, staunch on the appearance where if you know she'd look at some of the way the girls are today and stuff well when she's grown up if a girl had earrings you know that was she's a whore you know basically that's what tattoos if any woman that had a tattoo she was down you know she didn't like that at all but uh she never said anything about it though either she wouldn't talk talk bad about people and she said well you know different up people have different upbringings and that's just the way it is, you know. You don't, you can't judge somebody by it, but you will be judged if you ha if you are that way, you know. And she, she took a explained a lot, you know that that was one of the big things. She said, "Don't get tattoos. Don't do this. Don't do that," because you will be judged by it by somebody. She said a lot of a lot of people don't have open minds and stuff, but she did. She had a real open mind. She's really good with a lot of people. And a lot of people liked her. That's so neat. And did she ever work in any accounting or work at the Iron King Mine? I don't know if she worked in accounting. I think she might have, they might have took the stuff to her, to her at the bank, I imagine. I know that the reason they even put the Valley Bank started and put a branch in Mare was because of um, Cordes's, the Cordes family, and uh, Orm School, Orm, Charlie Orm because he had, they had great, I guess they had some very large accounts, and they'd have to travel all the way to Black Canyon, was the closest branch, so they, they there, that's how the branch in Mare got started, was because of those two people, and I think the Dugas, maybe the Duguses too, there was like three or four families that had very large accounts with Valley Bank, so they opened up their own branch in, in Mare for them, and that's where she stayed there for 30 years. And Valley Bank's a precursor to Bank One and then to Chase, To, to right? Chase, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and I think there was a first interstate in there, too. I think it was first interstate for a while, but it, yeah, Valley Bank is now Chase, mm -hmm. Chase Bottom. Yeah, because I remember, actually, where I'm from, that they had a Valley Bank, and our neighbor was an, um, a banker mm. there. <laughs> and then, um, do you have any other memories of her that are maybe related to the mine? It doesn't seem like she was. Involved. She wasn't. She wasn't really related to the mine because she worked. At, she was separate from. She was very independent. She was separate from that. You know, she was. My grandpa did the mining, and but her stepdad, he was a state mine inspector. He worked at the mine. They had mine. He had mines in in Crown King, I believe it was Crown King, and someplace and someplace else, but. Her, yeah, she didn't like mining, she didn't like mining, and she didn't like, she hated agriculture. She didn't like anything, she didn't, hate, she hated being on a farm. She said she's, when she was a kid, she was scared to death of the cows. She didn't, she didn't like cows, and she would, she said they'd go tell her to go milk a cow and stuff, and she'd just go sit out there on a bucket for a while and go back in and just kind of shake her head until they finally wouldn't ask her, because she said she's just scared to death of it. She said, and was scared, of, she was always scared of the dark and scared of the cows, and Kind of weird how it was, you know, somebody could be like that and then not even think twice about climbing on a plane and going to Egypt. You know, it's, it's just kind of bizarre. Yeah, she took other risks. <laughs> yeah, it took other risks, but she didn't like she didn't like animals. She didn't like horses at all. And dogs, big dogs. She's scared of dogs. I think she must have got bit when she was a little kid or something because she didn't like dogs at all. She didn't mind little dogs, but any dog, dog over about 20 pounds she stayed clear of. And um, do you, uh, you don't live in Dewey Humble, do you? No, I don't. I've lived in Mare, but I was within an eight-mile radius or whatever they had for the studies. And 
I know that you're very active, although in the community and mayor and also in Dewey Humboldt, I've seen you at the Awa Fria Festival. Yeah. What are some of the, st of the different activities that you do, organizations and groups um, that you're I'm president of the Big Bug Mining, Mining District and have been for six years now, six years. We, st they start, we started that as a um, mining, to bring back the mining districts. Well, then we found out that the mining districts were disbanded when to Arizona became state. So that's why you couldn't bring them back because they disbanded them. But we still have, now it's just a mining district LLC, and it's more of a club, kind of like Gold Prospectors of America. And I'm part of that, too. I just do. I was at uh, Mortimer's Farms last couple of weeks helping with the Gold Prospectors of America, a GPAP, which is Gold Prospectors of Arizona Phoenix chapter, which is a GPAA type thing. Was helping with that. Um, I'm in the mayor rec, mayor rec center. I'm the vice president of that. We do mayor days, and we uh, rec center is actually it's an independent 5013c um, nonprofit, and it's separate from the county because and it's always has been separate. However, if we if our board if we lose some board members, if it gets low, then the county takes it over. So that's why we're staying active with that. And we got, we maintain the buildings and stuff that the, they have in mayor and works out pretty good. But we do uh, like um, toys for tots at Christmas for kids that are kind of, that need, you know, that kind of poor, I, I guess. You know, the, the, we get a list from the school. There's people at the school give us a list of kids that come get gifts and stuff that need them, that need them basically. And we open the center for any time there's a disaster or anything like that. And you can also rent the center if you want to have a wedding or anything in that direction. But I'm part of that. Um, I'm trying to think what else. I know there's a couple more. Big Bug Mining District, the Mayor Rec Center. The... Are you part of the Historical Society? Kind, not, I'm not a member of it, but I do a lot of stuff with them. Because it's... I just, they, they were changing around back and forth and they had a museum and then they didn't and then they wanted to move it to mayor and they didn't and I didn't want to get involved until they got something, you know, until they got something kind of solid and a place to go because I, I didn't really agree with the way, some of the ways they were doing stuff so I didn't even try to get involved because I didn't, you know, why get in and butt heads for no reason. And what are some of the activities that you do, I guess, for the Big Bug District? Uh, we do. We have five or we have six claims, actual mining claims where you can go and prospect on them. And we got to have a couple on Big Bug Creek itself. We have a couple, one up in the mountains at Turkey Creek. We have uh, another one up here by the. I think we got one by them up close to the Iron King Mine now, or we were getting ready to. Excuse me. And when did you first become aware of the Iron King mine tailings? Well, you've been there since I was a little kid. So you've always been. My well, my grandpa he made sure we always stayed away from them, you know. And that's when we, he'd we'd take stuff up to the assay office at the Iron King, because we had uh, a product in Mare that was similar to Ironite, but it was all natural off the side of the hill up down there, and we'd take it up to get it assayed. And whatnot, and he's was we were driving through. He'd show me places that you know don't go here, and it was still had the big hole where the steam came out of and stuff. When I was a little kid, there was steam coming out of it, and I always just thought it was kind of fascinating when we get up on top of there and everything was all brown and yellow and weird colors and stuff. And I didn't really realize what it was at the time because I was just a little kid. But now I know why he wanted us to stay away from him because he knew it was bad. But yeah, as you grew up as a kid, just hearing your grandfather say, "Yeah, stay away. yeah, stay away," because he was he was worked there, and then my great grand grandpa was the state. He he worked there also, but then he was was the state mine inspector. He was a deputy state mine inspector for his state, and he was the same way. You know, don't he, they were big time. They were big on making sure we never because I've never been in a lot of the mines and stuff. Even though because we were always told not, you know, we were made sure we didn't go in them they were we'd get in trouble you know that they, they everybody knew they were dangerous they knew they were you know different things even the mines they worked in they knew what parts were bad and if you didn't know that 
then you're just, you know, flirting with disaster when you go inside. So we never went inside any of them. And how did you first learn or when did you first learn um, of the contamination when like you were talking a little bit about that you would see the colors, you'd see like signs of it, but when did you first really learn that it was contaminated, the tailings and the smelter area? Uh, probably through the Superfund and par partially due to I didn't really realize how intent, how much, how much pre the prevalence of some of the bad stuff on it because I I I've almost poisoned myself like three different times from just messing around with rocks that had arsenic in it, you know, and I didn't realize that. And I was had a bench grinder grinding on it and get the dust all over you and breathing it in and stuff like that. And you get really sick and, you know, bad is bad news. And that's how I, I learned, learned a lot of it and got a, through it from Brian, from Brian Beck. You know, he's like, you don't want to be doing that. You know, you're messing with your Said because he was he was just kind of quizzing me one day and I, I said, so he said this rock is this and I said like, yeah and he said wrong he said I said don't say he's I said I got tonnage of that at my house I've t picked it all up and he's like you don't want that he said there was a reason those were in little piles out on the mountain he said because they're they're bad news he said I, so I told him I went and I picked up all the piles and took them to my house and he's like you don't even want want no part of that because it's twenty two percent arsenic by weight. And I had all this thing, you know, I'd brought poison home to the house straight, and I was just grinding on it, smashing them up and doing everything, got pretty sick. And then the other time was when I was, I was melting, I was going to make, make my own coins, and I was melting some, turned out to be lead. I thought it was silver, but it was lead, and I got gassed a couple times pretty good from it, and, you know, it's, it's bad news. And it doesn't take much to make you really sick. And after you see that... The amount of stuff that was blowing in the old days and everything yeah you can see where if it's in the dirt or right there and you're out in it every day you're going to get messed up or your kids are going to be messed up more or less if you're not your kids probably will be or you'll definitely be able to see it because you can definitely see it and some of the families that were around the uh, well they're not there now because they're all dead <laughs> that kind of says it and it kind of tells you right there and when did you first hear about uh, the, I'm the formal Iron King Mine and Humboldt Smelter Superfund. Uh, it's one of the community when they had an open house at the school in the gymnasium. And I heard about that through, I think, Brian and Rose. Was it Rose that had it? Yeah, um, she, they emailed me, and so I went to it. And I've been following it kind of ever since. And um, what... Is the information that you're receiving about it, do you currently receive any information yeah. on it? Yeah, I receive all the updates on everything. And I also take part in the um, harvested rainwater with the Project Harvest. I'm in part of that, too. So that's been kind of interesting. And did you ever work? So you never worked at the Iron Ironite company because nope. your grandfather yep, was Yeah, we were, put the kibosh on all that. And uh, what other meetings did uh, have you attended that have to do with the Superfund site? The Dewey Humboldt community meetings, I've been going, going to those. And any of the other ones that I get emails on, I pretty much I try to make them if I can. I went to the last meeting a couple of weeks ago when they came up for the, to, to do the, I don't know, synopsis or whatever. They give an update on everything. And what did you think about the update? Because I unfortunately I haven't seen it on the televised video. Um, I don't know. I can see where there's going to be it's going to be people button heads for a long time into the future because there's you know economic effects of it. You know, there's finance. People got money involved in it, and people wanted to, there want people that want to develop stuff, and people that you know are dead set against it, and. There, you got your stakeholders and your EPA. It seems there there's could be a couple of different ways to go about it, I think, but I don't have any chips in the game, so to say, or anything, so I don't really have an, I don't really, can't really say much about it because it doesn't really involve me on that, that end of it. And have you ever um, observed any community health issues, like reoccurring 
I don't know, issues in the community besides, I know you're mentioning some of the people around the smelter. Yeah, around in Humboldt, that's what I think in Humboldt itself, some of the older families that have lived there for, or did live there, a lot of them have moved out, but they were always just different, you know, just a little bit different, nothing bad or anything like that. They were just a little bit different, and now you can see why. I mean, the lead and the arsenic and stuff, it actually it affected them. It affected this generation. You can see this in the second, third, and how it progressed. You know, it never got any, any better, and there wasn't any of them, you know, taking and finishing any master's degrees or anything, so to say. A lot of them didn't even go, you know, finish high school, I wouldn't think. And they were just kind of left out. And they're not left out. They just were left behind because of, you know, the being slowed down from the issues you cop know, this stuff the, me, the heavy metal poisoning basically heavy metal to, the toxicity of the me, heavy metals is, you can you could see it in them you can still see it in them in in some of the people i mean that's what it's sad but it's true you know and that's what a lot of people don't want to talk about it but that's where it's can you know there's not that's what it's from it's not from anything else it weren't you know, those defects don't come from natural you know they were if you could you could if they would have been raised five miles away from that it probably wouldn't happen to them and have you ever participated in any of the health studies that have been conducted no. in the area no and then as a longtime resident of the area what are some of the most important issues that your community is facing i would say probably just the how the Person myself, I would say it was just the overstep of the private, the, the governments, the city, the county. They just keep getting more, more impending, and you know the people that are moving in. The development has a, some, some to do with it, but you can't blame people for wanting to move here. I mean, it's awesome here right now. I mean, it's perfect weather and stuff. And you look in Detroit or anything, you can't blame somebody for wanting to move here at all. But at the same time, if you move here, don't bring the same problems that you're trying to get away from. You know, bring them back, bring them out here. Don't you're when they move out here, and then a lot of times the first thing they do is they start complaining about this or that or the cattle. Or you know, you moved in next to them. They didn't move in next to you. You moved in next to them. And if you don't want them in your yard, put up a fence. It's as easy as as it is. You know, that's sort of a lot of the and the city of. Dewey Humboldt, I think that was, personally, I think it was a mistake going to a city, but, you know, I don't live here. I don't, it's not one of my votes, so I can't really say that, but I know that it's all economic. It doesn't really have to, you know, it's just economic and different jobs and who's working for what. And it says a lot, it says a lot about the different, I kind of lost it, lost for words. Um, I want to say hierarchy, but it's, that's not it, but. You know the over just the overstep of the government coming in saying tell them what people can and can't do when it doesn't really affect them. I don't think that they have they don't need to be meddling in a, the people's business. You know, who cares if they got a Connex box in their backyard? You know, let alone have to it has to be painted a certain color or this or that. If that's that's I think they're just out of out of step there. But it's the way you progress. You you know you can't progress is going to happen regardless. So. You either accept it or you don't. <laughs> okay, Dale. Uh, can you talk a little bit about if any of your properties or residences, if they were involved in the remedial action that the United States Environmental Protection Agency? I believe one of them was, and I'd sold the. I had it. It was on the corner of Prescott and. I can't remember the other, the cross street, but it's right on the old Black Canyon Highway and Prescott Street right there on the corner, right below the smelter. And I believe it was. And it was at, it would have happened after I'd sold it and they came in and I don't know, if, there's a brand new house on it now. So I'm, I'm sure that they had, somebody did, that was cleaned up. Probably one of the first properties that was cleaned up, I imagine. Because it was, there's had a house on it and there was a trailer before that, and it came. Somebody they tore the trailer down and, and scooped up all the dirt and everything. So I imagine that was. I didn't have anything to do with it, but it, well, I had that property at one time. 
And so it seems like you're mentioning there's a huge growth in the area then. Is that what's happening in the in the area, like Dewey Humboldt Mayor? Oh, it's, yeah, it's booming right now. It's been, it's, it, a lot of it's the white flight out of California. You know, there's a bunch of people, it, uh, lots of people coming in out of California, which you can't blame them, you know, not a bit. And there's, that's what's driving, I think that's probably what's driving a lot of our economy right now is the people moving in from there and the retirees from all over the United States are moving here. There's a lot, of, I know there's a lot of uh, retired um, military. There's a lot of retired military, a lot of high brass military that retired to the Prescott area. And everybody that retires here usually coming in has a little bit of money. So, I mean, it's, it drives the economy pretty good, really. And that's, that's, I think that's what drive it, what is driving it, because it's not like there's any big jobs around here. It's not like there's, well, Baghdad, Baghdad's one of the big mine, but it's on the other side of Prescott, but it's nothing like the, it's not, it's not an economic driver like it was in the past. You know, in the, back, I don't know, in the 50s and stuff, you had Baghdad, you had Iron King, those were all the economic drivers of the whole place. Now there's other, other things that, the mines aren't that driver. They could be, but they're not. You know, there's a lot of other stuff going on. And thinking back on your experience on the Superfund site, what would you recommend or like to see future generations learn about the experience of the site? I think they would, I don't know if it would be good by not listing something on a Superfund and let them try to, you know, maybe have like a, a trial area or a, a window, a five-year window, or something. Try to they that to work something out. Say, well, you're, we're going to give you a five-year window to come up with a plan on how to alleviate this before we list you as a super fun site, or and see what see what would happen. Because I think there's a lot of other different ways. Because once you're listed as a super fun site, the stigmatism, you know, the stigma of the, just the super fund itself is pretty bad. And let, but there might be ways to figure it out and clean it up without and being listed as a super fund and be able to do it in a faster and more efficient manner because that's I know it's going to be tied up for years now you can see you can already see it, it's going to be tied up for probably at least 10 or 15 maybe 20 30 years who knows but it's going to be tied up for a while and how do you learn about the progress of the cleanup of the through the meetings the updates and stuff I think they even got a I don't know if they have a website or not I think they do. And what is useful or not useful in the information that you're receiving? I don't know. I think pretty much all everything they got is you know pretty need and stuff that you should know or want want to know about. I think it's all pretty much good information. And what in uh, I guess studies or research do you think is important to occur in the area of the two sites? Um, what the actual health effects are i mean that you see what what actual chemicals are showing up what you know how do you alleviate some of them what do you do you have do you make some of the areas where they know are contaminated make sure that they don't develop them until they're cleaned up or just leave them off limits you know because if something's going to happen if you do develop that area something you're if you have a family that lives there for a while you're going to have you're going to see the effects the consequences of it so, I mean, that's one of the things that I don't really know about that. That's just, you should probably, you know, you should clean it up or be able to sign a waiver, but you shouldn't be able to pass it off on somebody else without letting anybody, you know, there needs to be a somebody that's held accountable for it if they try to pass it off. If they know it's bad and they try to pass it off and not tell anybody, then they should be held accountable for it. And have you heard of that happening in the area? Not really that, but I, I know that that happened. I know it could happen real easy if they lift this, um, pull the where it wasn't listed as a super fund. There'd be some property changes going on real quick. And are you surprised in any of the information that you learned? I'm surprised that there's not a lot more people and want to know. You know, that a lot of people they it's just ignore it. And that's what's crazy is you're going, you're moving in next door to it and you just want to pretend that it's not toxic. You know, there's, and it doesn't bother you a bit. You know, that's what's kind of crazy. Is there any uh, advice that you have for the agencies that are in charge of the site? I'd say maybe 
well, and not just necessarily that site, but in all together, all around that the mining isn't what it was a hundred years ago and stuff. They could, if they'd back off some of the regulations and let and have an open mind on some of these newer methods, they can have, you can have a full blown mining operation going right in the middle of a town and nobody even know the difference because everything's going on underneath the gr underground. You know, they can have everything set up underground and take care of a lot of the stuff without even nobody even knowing it's going on and let alone have you know it, i think at the iron king there's several different ways they could clean it up right now but they won't they won't bend you know they won't bend at all and it would be beneficial for everyone the people that currently own it the property owners the other the companies that could come in and actually process the stuff and make money with it and take some of the chemicals out of it and put it back it would be cleaned up when it went back it would be the pile be cleaned up and it'd be taken care of but i don't know if it's nobody wants to get their feelings hurt or some nobody wants to bend or anything like that but i think that's what that would be the easiest and what do you think for the smelter site do you have any opinion on that i don't know i know i'm not i know that the fallout zones around it are what's the most critical you know because that was the fallout zones for the wind but then I don't know if they're going to, I mean, I'm sure the stack's going to have to come down because it's getting pretty rickety, I'm sure of it. But then it's a landmark too, you know, people on the landmark status, but still it's a, the status of landmark being it's highly polluted, you know, that's what, like the smelter, and the smokestack in Mare, it was never ran. It was never, it's, it's, it was just a big mining scam basically, and it never had any production ran through it, so it's just a big, big smokestack sitting next to the highway. But the one in Dewey here in Humboldt, it had all kinds of stuff ran through it. I think there was 13 of them running at one time. You know, that's fallout zones all the way around. You can look around. If there's nothing growing, probably not good. That's kind of a telltale sign right there. If there's no plants on growing, then probably not very good stuff in the ground. And you can see all the way around them smelters. You can see big patches where nothing's growing. It's probably not the best best place in the world to build a house, you know. Might be a nice view, but it's probably not a good spot to build a house. And is there anything else that you would like to discuss that um, I might have missed or a story that you just want to add to your oral history? <clears throat> not that I can think of. Not right offhand. Not... The picture is Rudy, Rudy Chemis and my grandpa. There's obviously telling story, you know, reenacting a hunting scene or something on the front of a in front of the bar it was at uh, Humboldt bar in 1959 and there's a some kind of wildcat wildcat mountain lion or something and uh, Rudy Chemis has a, a very large pistol and you can tell that it's probably just the same as it was today as it was back then you know big some little bit of alcohol and some wild hunting stories but it's a really neat picture I like that. that's why I really like about it